neighbour and History Society <laughs> member, George Wishart, um, produced very useful background information for me um, about Air Sea Rescue, based on work he personally did on his father, who served in the Air Sea Rescue Service. I hope you don't mind me mentioning this, George. Um, but the background information that he provided in terms of sources and books has been very helpful to me, although not specifically relevant to uh, the particular unit here. Second, um, I've drawn liberally and extensively from local material, uh, particularly David Collins' wonderful book on Kakubri, which has a, an excellent section on air sea rescue in it. Uh, for any of you who haven't looked at what he said about air sea rescue. Um, third, I'd like to acknowledge the help I received from my friend, who's not a member of the History Society, Marty Clark. Um, I used her computer skills extensively because mine are highly inadequate. So although she's not here, because she's got better things to do, <laughs> um, I do acknowledge very much the help she gave me. And none of these uh, people or sources that I've used are in any way responsible for any inadequacies or shortcomings in the presentation tonight. That's all to me. Um, before I start talking about the SC Rescue Unit, I think it might just be useful to spend a minute talking about Gibb Hill, because um, in looking at this unit, um, everybody talked about Gibb Hill, but I couldn't find out anything about what Gibb Hill meant until I sought the advice and help of Dr. Alan James. Uh, and he wrote, I have turned up a little background. It's Gibbs Hill on Gibbs Hill's Point on the Ordnance Survey six inch map, first edition, 1854. The Ordnance Survey surveyor's name book says, quote, a small elevated portion of the bank of the River Dee situated on the farm of Bishopton and a short distance to the east side of Bishopton Wood. It took its name from a man called Gibb, who was wont to be in the habit of fishing here. While etymologies in the name books, in the name books have to be taken with a pinch of salt, I think it's fairly likely a man with that very common name, short for Gilbert, and in the Scottish surname Gibson, was associated with the place at some time. There's another Gibbs Hill, Gibbs Hill, naming a dwelling and plantation in Balmaclellan Parish, a Gibbs house in Colvend, and quite a few other names involving Gibb in the counties around the Solway. It is, however, just possible that the name was Gallic, gob, meaning beak, point, or headland, Perhaps more so if the hill was named, and I can't say the Gallic, summit of the point. I notice Maxwell reckoned Gibbon, a point of rock at Rascarrel, was the diminutive form of Gobbin. So that's where the idea of Gibb Hill comes from in the Gallic originally. Now I'll talk about number 55 Air Sea Rescue Marine Unit, Gibb Hill, Kakubri. Number 55 Air Sea Rescue Marine Craft Unit was based at Gibb Hill, Kakubri between March 1942 and December 1944 during World War II, a period of 34 months. The objective of this talk is to share with you the results of research by me to discover more on the work done by the unit. I first came across the fact that the unit had existed in the 1990s when driving from Borg to Kakubri while on holiday in the area before we moved to Kakubri. 
As I drove along the River Dee from Borg, I encountered an unusual looking large structure which was being used as a wooden sawmill at Gibb Hill. The most unusual feature of the building, apart from its size, was an observation oblique stroke lookout oblique stroke viewing platform on the top at one end. The site too was unusual with the presence of concrete boats that weigh into the river, evidence there had been fuel tanks with pumps near the concrete slipway, and a number of military looking 1940s brick buildings, some of which could have been barracks and some with flat concrete roofs, which could have been used as storage buildings and as air raid shelters. Inquiries made at the museum in Kukubri revealed Gibb Hill had been used during World War II as the site of an air sea rescue marine craft unit. It was one of 67 air sea rescue marine craft units scattered around the coast of Britain. Adjacent ones in our sort of area would have been Patheli in North Wales, Menai in North Wales, Fleetwood, Douglas in the Isle of Man, Portaferry in Northern Ireland, Larne in Northern Ireland, and Dromore in Air. But overall, there were 67 of them. Britain's experience in the early years of the Second World War was that even with the help of civilian vessels and the Royal Navy, aircrew who bailed out or ditched in the North Sea or the English Channel only had a 20% chance of being returned to their squadrons. Between July 1940 and October 1940, Britain lost 200, over 200, hard to replace pilots. In light of this, the RAF created an air sea rescue. Oops, sorry. Yes, creation. Turn two pages. Let's start again. Between July 1940 and October, Britain lost over 200 hard to replace pilots. In light of this, the RAF created a directorate of air sea rescue in February 1941, which adopted the motto, the sea shall not have them. Operationally, it became known as air sea rescue services. The headquarters was co-located with Coastal Command with which it was to operate closely. As more high-speed launches became available, these were formed into dedicated air sea rescue units. These units worked to improve the survival of air crews through the development and issue of better survival equipment, including one-man inflatable dinghies for fighter pilots, the training of air crew in ditching drills to maximize their chances of surviving, the development and fielding of air droppable survival equipment, and better cooperation and coordination among the different branches, services, and units involved in locating and retrieving downed aircrew. It was the role of air sea rescue air squadrons to locate downed airmen and keep them alive by dropping survival equipment and stores. It was the role of the air sea rescue marine craft launches to pick up the downed aircrew. Now, during the Second World War, although this part of Scotland was away from the front line of war, a lot of military related work and activity took place in the region, as many of you will know. For example, it was a very important training area for flying, navigation, and bomber training, and the RAF had a number of establishments in the region to support these tasks. Three airfields in Wigtonshire and others in northwest England were used extensively for training pilots, and much of the territory over which they flew consisted of the Solway Firth and the North Irish Sea. 
as flying training facilities around the Solway Firth expanded, additional air-sea rescue services were required in this area. Part of the requirement was met when number 55 Air Sea Rescue and Marine Craft Unit was opened on the 23rd of March 1942 at Gibb Hill on the D estuary, two miles south of Kukubri. As well as the Air Sea Rescue Services carried out from Gibb Hill, the Marine Craft section of the unit was involved in towing targets to assist in the training, training of bomber pilots and crews. Replicas of submarine periscopes were towed 600 fathoms, a fathom is six feet, I think, behind seaplane tenders, three of which were based at Gibb Hill. The seaplane tenders were small craft with a wheelhouse forward, but partially open aft, and each was powered by a twin Perkins engine. Might be time to change the slide, actually. <laughs> there is the insignia uh, of the, can you see ASR on top, ASC Rescue Services? Uh, George Wishart uh, gave me a photograph of that. And can you move on again? Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is a model of a seaplane tender um, used to, to ferry people to uh, uh, seaplanes, uh, but of often used as a support vehicle by air sea rescue units. And there's a lovely picture of a high speed launch, the sort of thing that we're talking about. I don't know where it's from, but you can see the RAF roundel on the front on the bow. Thank you. The air sea rescue unit was initially equipped with two pinnaces and commanded by a flight lieutenant. The parent station, which provided backup services, such as accounting and medical services, was initially RAF station Silleth in what was then Cumberland. This was changed in August 1942 when the nearer RAF station at Wigton became the parent station. In February 1943, a third pinnace was brought in to ensure adequate cover for the area of operation, which was the whole of the Solway Firth, east of a line from Burrow Head in Wigtonshire to St. Bees Head in Cumberland. A 24-hour watch was maintained with one boat always in immediate readiness to avoid any risk of being stranded at low water the duty boat was moored in sheltered deep water off Ross Island at the mouth of the estuary or in the Cutter's Pool close to Kikubri Lifeboat Station. And two 12-foot planing dinghies were used for the transfer of crews. The pinnaces were eventually replaced by two 68-foot Vosper high-speed launches, each displacing 32 tonnes. Powered by twin Thornycroft RY-12 engines, they were capable of 28 knots and were armed with Browning machine guns to port and starboard the wheelhouse and an Orlikon gun at the stern. Each of the high-speed launches had a skipper, a coxswain, a wireless operator, two or three crewmen and a fitter who all lived on board in highly cramped conditions. There was no designated cook. And for a time, each member of the crew was expected to take his turn. This system had to be abandoned in Kukubri on at least one vessel after the fitter on cook's duties was found to be liberally covered with engine oil. <laughs> Despite the activities of this particular fitter, the food on board was preferred to that at the base 
And to some extent, this was due to the fact that the crews bought their own provisions in Kakubri and had been able to develop a good relationship with the local butchers. Variety was introduced to the cuisine by the practice of fishing for mackerel from the launch's dinghies while moored at the Rost. Allegations were occasionally made regarding illicit working of the salmon years <laughs> close to Gibb Hill by individuals who may or may not have had anything to do with number 55 Air Sea Rescue Marine Craft Unit. The unit itself, some 60 people were based at number 55 Air Sea Rescue Marine Unit at any one time. As well as the crews of the launches, these included carpenters, electricians, and wireless operators. Five WAFs were also stationed at Gibb Hill, but they were billeted at various private houses in the town. <laughs> they were employed in the cookhouse, the stores, as a wireless operator, and as a driver of the unit's 30 hundredweight lorry. The site at Gibb Hill uh, was aligned with the deeper channel of the River, River Dee. The buildings were to some extent prefabricated. Can we move on? That's a plane. <laughs> <laughs> Sunderland, yes, lovely. And the love, love, lovely model. <laughs> ah, there's the unit. I'm obscuring the bottom end of it. That's a, an aerial photograph, probably taken in about 1945. Uh, let me start this bit again. Uh, there were five wafts stationed that, that they were billeted in the town, employed in the cookhouse, the stores, as a wireless operator, and as a driver of the unit's 30 hundred lorry. The site, and there's a wonderful photograph of it, um, that woodland is gone now, as you will see, it's been pulled down. Uh, Kakubri is up on the right of the picture as you're looking at it, and Borg is on the left of the picture. So we're about two, two miles out from Kakubri. Wonderful aerial view. Um, it was aligned with the deeper channel. The buildings were to some extent prefabricated, I'm told. Uh, and similar bases intended for the same function, situated in different parts of Britain. The largest building, which you can see at the front there, was the workshop at the head of the slipway which was used to service and maintain all the various vessels and equipment. The slipway here was apparently made by of bags of cement thrown into the water and further cemented together and smoothed. There'd already been a slipway there of some sort. There was a winch house for pulling boats in for maintenance and repair. And that would be at the side of the big building above the uh, slipway. Adjacent to this building were three billets linked together by the ablutions block. And you can see the three buildings in your picture behind the big workshop building. An extremely powerful light was mounted at Gibb Hill, pointed to Silloth Airfield to assist pilots with direction finding, but it was seldom used. The building closest to the entrance gate housed the sergeant's mess and cookhouse, the dining room and the recreation room. The square unit you can see on the picture, that's here, there we are. Square unit was probably a water tank for firefighting. Between it and the entrance gate were gardens proudly maintained by the base's complement and noted for the display of wallflowers. I was surprised to learn about that. I would have thought they'd have grown vegetables, but there we are. There were that's, apparently that's the, garden. the garden just up at the top here. You know, yeah. Yeah, there's the, the road. Um, wallflowers, there we are. There were apparently, down here if you point, beehives on the south edge 
Apparently, Borg honey was highly prized and sold in London in the 19th century. Um, and bees seem to thrive in that particular part of uh, this area because the honey depends on a mixture, not just of ordinary plants, but sea plants as well. According to David Collins' excellent book, Kakubri, An Alphabetical Guide to Its History, those people stationed at Uni 55 generally found their work interesting and exciting, though the considerable time spent by crews on standby, rolling around on a mooring, sorry, must have been frustrating and uncomfortable. The crews worked three-day shifts and highlights of their days off included, listen to this, attending dances in Kukubri Town Hall, going to the Kukubri Picture House, and I think, was that where Tesco is now? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and having Saturday lunches that once was the D restaurant in St. Cuthbert Street, where bacon and eggs with tea and fancy cakes could be purchased for two and sixpence. <laughs> While doing research for this talk, I uncovered on the BBC World War II People's War Archive um, an, an article about life at that time describing Kukubri and what Kukubri was like during the war. Although I haven't included this here, if anybody's interested in this, because it's an interesting read in its own right, I'm happy to pass on the information to you. And it was written by a lady called Alexa Jones uh, and contributed to the BBC in 2005. I've got some recollections from people who were children growing up in Kakubri during the war. And there are those who were at the Johnson School who had the excitement of seeing tanks and armored vehicles arriving at the railway station just across the road and being driven through the town for the tank proving range. Some have memories of Canadian and Polish troops being stationed here. One person has recollected French commandos practicing climbing and abseiling on the castle walls. I haven't heard of that one before. And some, of course, recall the launches belonging to the Air Sea Rescue Unit moving around the River Dee. The unit itself. Unfortunately, I've been unable to locate any memories, diaries or letters in public archives kept specifically by personnel who served in number 55, Air Sea Rescue Marine Craft Unit, to share with you in spite of a very widespread search. However, they must have been a hospitable group of people because some locals who were children at the time recalled the Christmas parties that they held. I have, though, managed deep in the archives at Kew to locate and obtain, at great personal cost, a copy of the operational daily journal for the unit, which covers the period from October 1942, when the facility opened, until the end of December 1944, the period over which number 55 Air Sea Rescue Unit operated in Kakubri. I uncovered this journal in the National Archives at Kew. Unfortunately, it's not available online, but I was able to arrange a photocopy to be made, as I say, at great cost. And if anybody wants to see it, uh, they're welcome to do so. Basically, it contains a very brief record of daily events at the unit for the time that is operating. The first line of the, uh, the what do you call this? Operational Daily Journal reads, number 55, Air Sea Rescue Marine Craft Unit, Kukubri, 23rd of March, 1942, <coughs> unit formed. Pinnaces, 1208 and 1206 allocated. 
and then there's information about the signals. The last entry reads, 55 Air Sea Rescue Marine Craft Unit officially closed down 11th of December 1944. Base party remained for disposal of marine craft and equipment. An analysis of the operational daily journal reveals some interesting aspects of the work of the unit. First of all, there were some early problems with the command of the unit. On the 22nd of April, 1942, shortly after it had been set up, a Flight Lieutenant Beatty arrived from RAF Bridlington to take command. However, on the 22nd of January, 1943, just about 11 months later, Flight Lieutenant Beatty was cashiered from the RAF. And to cashier means to dismiss with dishonor. I didn't explore further the nature of the cause of his dismissal. He was, however, replaced by a Flight Lieutenant Murphy who arrived at the unit from number 58 Air Sea Rescue Base in Larne to take command on the 10th of March, 1943. And he remained in command, Flight Lieutenant Murphy, right until the unit closed down on the 11th of December, 1944. Second, during its existence, the unit had a variety of vessels under its control. The operation, care and maintenance of vessels was a significant feature of its work and many staff at the unit were involved in this skilled marine engineering work. The pinnaces were regularly taken out of the water or slipped, as it was known, for inspection, maintenance and repair. The unit workshop was also used for inspection, maintenance, repair by other air sea rescue units, notably Unit number 53 at Fleetwood on the Lancashire coast, number 54 at Douglas in the Isle of Man, and number 64 at Dremore, in the, that's the southernmost village in Scotland, located at the southern end of the Rin, Rins of Galloway in Dumfries and Galloway. It is clear from the operational daily journal that the Kukubri Air Sea Rescue Marine Craft Unit played an important regional role in supporting the work of other units, crews, uh, and units. Uh, and these units were regular visitors to Kukubri. Can we move on the slide? Oh, yeah. okay. At the risk of being repetitive, the operational daily journal, and this is the formal operational daily journal, gives information on all of the 37 crash calls received by the unit. Now, local information says there were 32. Looking at the original document shows there were 37. Now, we'll be here all night if we look at all 37. So what I've just put on the, uh, on the slide for you is an indication of the sort of entry that uh, you get with these. Um, the first one, that actually this was the first crash that was recorded, was a hurricane that went down uh, south of St. Mary's Isle. The next one, uh, fortunately, no loss of life with this one. It was a Catalina uh, making a forced landing in the sea, uh, and of Catalinas entitled to be in the sea anyway, so... It was the conditions at the time that were a bit rough. Um, near the beach at Garliston, uh, a plane came down. And I put this one in because you will see the crew was saved by civilian craft. Now, that quite often happened. Fishing boats would sometimes pick up down, pardon me, down to airmen. Uh, probably a well-known one locally is... Uh, a swordfish naval aircraft, which came down in Tongland. I suppose anybody from Tongland will know about that. Uh, fortunately, they all survived. There were three on board 
and they landed where they shouldn't have landed. And then the other one that I've picked as an example is the unfortunate one when a bow fighter crashed on a house in uh, Dundrenham and unfortunately two airmen and four civilians were killed and that was well covered in the press at the time. I've got a whole, all the, a whole list of crash calls here and decided that it would be boring and repetitive to go through them. So given, having given those examples, sorry, that's more crash calls. <laughs> um, if, if you take the total, the crash call received on the 19th of November, 1944, was the last received by 55 Air Sea Rescue Marine Craft Unit. Altogether, <clears throat> over 12 people had been saved, plus an unspecified number, because in one return, it says all the crew was saved, and it doesn't specify uh, how many were in the crew. It was probably a couple. The crash call are, are of interest because the primary purpose of the unit was search and rescue. However, this was an operational unit and it's appropriate to talk about other aspects of it, particularly the people. During the time the unit operated, there was a regular flow of people into and out of uh, number 55 unit. Uh, also a regular flow of people who came on a routine basis. These would often be people who were inspectors, who made routine visits to check on things. The, the regional catering officer came to talk about the quality of the food. Uh, the dental service came a lot. Uh, chiropodists came a lot. Actually, the dental service was here an awful lot, surprisingly, given that we have trouble getting dentists these days, which was interesting. Um, and the operational uh, daily journal is also a terrific source of information uh, for family historians. I've got lots of examples of people whose progress I was able to track while we were, they were at the unit, their promotion, moving on to other units and so on. So if any of you had relatives in the air sea rescue units, uh, try to get hold of the operational journal because that's a, a very good way of finding out more. Can we move on with some samples? This, I've, I've included this. Uh, this is the building after the war. And some may remember this. It became a wood business. Um, but you can see that the essential features of the workshop remain <clears throat> with the lookout unit um, on top of the shed. And that was in place for some time. In fact, I think I recall seeing it when we first came here uh, back in the 1990s on holiday. Um, and it actually says, just to read it for you, number 55 Air Sea Rescue Unit was established at Gibb Hill in Kukubri in 1942. With all the air activity over the Solway, it provided a 24-hour rescue service from Burrow Head in Wigtonshire to St. Bees Head in Cumbria. At the time it closed, the end of 1944, it had attended 34 crashes. Well, I've told you it's 37 crashes. And 12 aircrew uh, had been saved. It was more than 12. Can we move on again, please? Here's another picture of the unit, as many of you will remember it more recently as a wood business. Uh, but the essential features of the workshop still remain. Thank you. And that's Gib Hill. Here it is in a sorry state, still the same unit, still with its top on. And again, please. Even worse, 
And finally, that's it with the, the walls have now gone. And they are all pictures of the units at Gib Hill. And the last one here, Mike, this is the unit at Dromore, which is uh, in Wigtonshire. Um, you can see the layouts are slightly different, but uh, similar sort of design. Closure of the unit. 55 Air Sea Rescue was closed down on the 11th of December, 1944. The vessels and the majority of the crews were transferred to the unit at Bucky. The buildings remained in the care and maintenance of RAF station Wigtown until November 1945, when they were taken over by 220 maintenance unit Dumfries to be used as a sub storage site. 1200 square feet of storage space was used to store surplus clothing pending disposal until the site was closed down in June 1946. The ownership of the site reverted to St. Mary's Island. My conclusion, the site at Gibb Hill is now a pleasing residential location. Next time you walk, cycle or drive by, you may want to reflect on the role it occupied as the site of number five Air Sea Rescue Marine Craft Unit in saving lives during World War II. Thank you for listening.